I have surveyed the table. And I have not found anything chocolate chip on the table tonight. Now, folks, I know that you think that I'm joking. But there is a religious significance to that. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the pastor saith to the churches, okay? Anyway, uh, no. I appreciate what you brought, and uh, and the food is good. But I mean, just a side note: I didn't I didn't see anything back there with chocolate chips on it. But that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, Johnny's not here yet. May not be here at all tonight. He had something he was needing to do, so he's asked Ernie and Linda to step in. And uh, they have agreed to do that, which I appreciate. So in just a moment, we're going to turn them loose. Uh, before they do, um, just want to mention again that uh, the funeral for Lois Blair is tomorrow at noon at the Palatag Lang Fendler uh, nursing, uh, not nursing home, funeral home in uh, Arnold. And so certainly be in prayer for Donald and his family. Uh, and. Uh, Trying to think if there's anything else updated that I can, can bring to you. I think that's that's the primary one. Um, well, had it been a good day, a beautiful day. Um, two or three have asked about what happened to me at the end of the service this morning. And it's not what happened to me at the end of the service. It's what happened to me at the beginning of the service. Um, I've been having some pain for the last three or four days. So I'm not just generally not feeling good, and I thought it was indigestion. And this morning, after, you know, during Sunday school, had a little bit of a backache. Thought maybe I was pregnant. I didn't know it. And, uh, <laughs> so after Sunday school, I stopped by the men's room. A kidney stone about the size of a uh, sesame seed. Ooh. And I don't mean to melodramatize it. I'm a very fortunate person. I've heard people say that they are very, very painful. Mine aren't. I've passed them three or four different times. And I don't have much pain, actually, of the stone. But... It left me just kind of weak need, And so in the worship service, I sat most of the time. And I started out sitting during the beginning of the message. If you noticed, I left the stool up there because it just wasn't quite sure. Anyway, by the end of the sermon, I kind of used all I had. And so I didn't, didn't mean to alarm anyone or melodramatize it. That's all that was going on. And uh, I just needed to sit down. I took it easy this afternoon. And, and so tonight I'm fun with, or fine that you know us. I'm sitting down again. But anyway, uh, a couple of neat things this morning in our worship service. Our, uh, our daughter, Becky, who works for Wells Fargo Advisors, left Friday. They flew her to Mumbai, India. And uh, uh, so this morning, Tony alerted me that my daughter had logged on from India, and she was watching our worship service. And uh, I don't know, somebody, and I haven't had a chance to check the page to see all of it, but Tony, you said somebody logged on and said they were worth, they were watching with their dad. Yeah, the And then, home. then Becky logged on and said, I'm watching my dad. I <laughs> anyway, this, you know, and of course, we're broadcasting tonight. It's just a, a, a neat deal. Next week, we will wrap up our study of the seven churches. And in that study, what I actually want to do is just kind of pull together some consensus of several different elements of what these seven letters represent. So that will be kind of a summary and wrap up, and, and, uh, and that will be next week. And, and like I said, it's miscellaneous night. The following Sunday night is our WMU candlelight service. Um, for uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And so that will be on the 14th. Following Sunday is Easter, and so we won't have a Sunday night service that night. So uh, just to kind of let you know what's coming, and, uh, and we'll keep you posted. And then after Easter, we'll launch uh, a new study, and I'll let you know what that is. So, okay, without further ado, let's thank God for the food and the fellowship. And uh, David Jacoby, would you lead us, please, as we pray? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> While you're doing it, I'll take advantage of the moment. One of the things that was brought up in our business meeting two or three weeks ago was that our bus, uh, particularly the big bus, was looking pretty shabby and uh, had a lot of mold on the top of it. It had been a long time since it had been washed. But it was still wear time, unfortunately. 
Well, David took it yesterday, I guess it was yesterday, and uh, took it to a car, a truck wash. And so if you notice as you go out, man, it looks sharp. And so David, I appreciate it. Give you out. Larry. I can't take all Oh, I'm sorry, Larry. Yes, we do appreciate it. Larry's chairman of the bus committee. And uh, it'll, it'll sell better clean than it would dirty. So I appreciate it very much. So it does. All right, so David, please, please, please. Father God, we thank you for this night and this opportunity to fellowship and enjoy a meal together while we learn more about your word and what it means for us here in this place. We ask your blessings on all the food and all the people that brought the food and prepared the food and on our gathering here this night. We ask this in the name of your most precious son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> so as we get started, attorney, if you're ready, let's do a couple of songs. Let's offer praise to the Lord. Okay. Grab one of those hymnals close to you. If you don't see one, there's a couple on this table here that's not being used. Number 353. Now, I haven't heard us sing this one here, so if you don't know it, you can get ready to learn one. Jesus is Lord of all. 353. Jesus is Savior and Lord of Master in joy and in strife, on him you too may call. Jesus is Lord of Oh, 
And so they secured it, and I had to go in manually and desecure it. So anyway, I think we're okay. All right. Each week we've talked about the key issues in studying the book of Revelation, and so we've talked about these before, just to list them for you. And we've used this as the basis for our study each week. Uh, from the first chapter of the Revelation, where John identifies himself, where he is, and the circumstances under which he receives from Jesus these dictated letters to the seven churches. I reminded you who John himself is, and by this time in his life and ministry, and in the history of the first century of the New Testament church, uh, these are important elements to understand, because knowing that John was the chosen vessel to pass along these letters is important in understanding their significance and their relationship. Okay, that being said, we've moved then to the seven letters, and these are the seven churches. And uh, notice Laodicea, wealthy with a medical center and luxurious city. It was a very profitable city. And they were famous for two things, eye salve and black wool. Okay, so that'll be helpful to keep in mind. There is a city near the ancient ruins of Laodicea. Laodicea actually sat up on a hill, and the modern city of Denizli is, is actually down in a valley. Um, and uh, as, as you'll see in a few moments, uh, part of the reason that it moved was because of a devastating earthquake. And, uh, and apparently the ground was very unstable where the city was located. Ongoing excavations in that city began only in 2003. So I'll show you a picture in a couple of moments. The work continues to uncover an expansive, wealthy city. It was built on a major highway. In fact, it was kind of like St. Louis. It was the convergence of highways from several directions that made Laodicea such a profitable city. And because of that, it was a commercial and banking center uh, it was known for its medical school, and uh, they had created or developed an eye salve that had a, a wide reputation, and as I mentioned, black wool. But the water was tepid and unpleasant. Nearby in Heropolis, there gushed hot thermal springs. And so people would go to those thermal springs to soak themselves and, you know, kind of a, a spa effect. But if they went the opposite direction to Colossae, there was cold water available. And so uh, you have Laodicea, and it had a little bit of warm water, a little bit of cold water. Stepping. But before the city was named Laodicea, it was called Diopolis, which literally translates the city of Zeus. And someone says, well, how is that? Because D-I-O or T-H-I-O is a recognition of a reference to God. And so it was the city of God. But God in this case was the Greek God Zeus. Okay, this is what they believe the remains of the church at Laodicea. And as you can see, the excavations there uh, have not advanced a whole lot, but um, uh, gives you at least some idea of, uh, of what it may have looked like. Um, so you can read what I've got here. The Apostle Paul instructed that his letter to the Colossians be read also in Laodicea. And you find that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. And he was encouraged by their strong faith in Christ, referenced in 2.5. Something seems to have changed, however, in the 30 years after Paul's letter, when John penned the book of Revelation. Wealth and independence had weakened their commitment to Christ. And that seems to be the case uh, again, some of the ancient ruins on that hillside. There was a temple to Zeus. That was often the case in the Greek world of that time. 
Uh, of course, it's modern day Turkey and it is predominantly Muslim. Okay, I made reference to an earthquake. Uh, they resettled after a devastating earthquake in 600 AD uh, and that it died out fully after the Turks came through the 11th century. Today, it's a city of over half a million people, but there are a few former Muslims who have been converted to Christianity. But predominantly, as with the other cities that we've studied, they have a very, very significant Muslim presence and a very limited Christian presence, if at all. Okay, modern city of Denizli, or Denizli is down here, and this is part of the hillside on which the ancient city of Laodicea would have rested. Okay, I have given you this list each week to let you know that there is a common theme in all seven letters and with only slight variations as you see listed uh, and we'll get to in a moment Laodicea is the only one that received no commendation there were two churches however Smyrna the second church and Philadelphia the sixth church against which uh, there was no condemnation or no criticism offered to them in every case there was a correction uh, with a promise in each case there was a call and a warning and uh, and finally uh, as you see the challenge uh, at the bottom okay that being said if somebody would volunteer to read for us the letter to the church at Laodicea anybody to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God, says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have nothing need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Okay. What do you want? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I said to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. So <coughs> this is the letter to the church <laughs> that is a closed door. And the contrast to that is our study at Philadelphia last week, the church with an open door. And so uh, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And the reason I underline that is because some folks, when they read that, get a little bit unsettled. And there are those who believe that Jesus Christ is or was a created being. That perhaps he was the first thing that God created when he began to create our universe. Uh, there was a heresy in the early church. We call it the Gnostic heresy. And uh, the Gnostics claimed they had special knowledge based upon God's revelation to them. And, and therefore, one of the things that they said was that Jesus was a created being. Some went so far as to say he was not God's son until his baptism. And he ceased to be God's son on the cross. And so, you know, the variations on that heresy uh, kind of spun both ways. But the ultimate point is that they, uh, uh, they just did not embrace Jesus as being fully equal with God. Recall that one of the things that the Jews brought back from the Babylonian captivity was a totally dedicated monotheism. 
They realized while they were in captivity in Babylon that the reason they were there because they had been unfaithful to God. And so they came back from Babylon totally committed that there is only one God. And that's why some 500 years later, as Jesus presented himself as the Messiah, as God's son, they struggled to understand that because God is only one. We already have a God. We don't have room for another God. And, and so that's why they struggled with it. That's why in John's gospel, he writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Everything that was created was created by him. So John made clear in the gospel, which some believe was actually written after the book of Revelation, that John laid that controversy to rest, cleared it up completely, that he was before creation, he was not himself a part of that <coughs> creation. So uh, something for us to, to keep in mind as we think about uh, our Christology, our theology of who Jesus Christ really is. Notice there was no commendation to the church at Laodicea. That was unique. All the other churches had some word of encouragement, some word of appreciation or of acknowledgement. There was none offered to the church at Laodicea. Okay. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and <laughs> naked. Okay. Jesus' description of the church at Laodicea and the church's description of the church at Laodicea are in stark contrast to each other. Okay. So their claim, you say, I am rich, I'm wealthy, have need of nothing. You do not realize you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Raise your hand if you'd like to join that church. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and so, so this is what they're faced with. Now, as in the other letters, there is a historical association in everything that Jesus says to those churches. In Laodicea, they had an aqueduct system because they were a city on a hill. And so, unfortunately, the water that made its way to them was influenced by the, the hot springs from Herapolis. And so the water was tepid at room temperature at best. And so, can you imagine if you're thirsty or if you're needing refreshment and you take a sip of water and it's not even room temperature, it's just slightly warm how unpleasant that can be. You want hot water for tea, you want cold water for refreshment, it was neither one, okay? So that was a historical reality in the city of Laodicea. Um, and I'm trying to think where it is. When Brenda and I used to go to Branson, uh, there was a time when the water in Branson had kind of a metallic taste to it. Larry, I don't know if you guys were ever away. Anyway, for the longest time when Brenda and I would go down there, she would always take a gallon of water so that we could make coffee and tea ourselves using the water we brought from St. Louis rather than the water down there. And, and uh, uh, so it's the same kind of thing. It was just disappointing to go to their spring expecting to have refreshment and not. Now, as I had shared earlier, they also uh, were a medical center and they were a trade or commercial center. They even coined their own money in Laodicea. So they were wealthy enough to do that. And they had become very comfortable with who they were. They were also known in the Roman Empire as a free city, which meant they did not have to have a Roman garrison watching over them like we see in Jerusalem, for example, in Jesus' time. Uh, so they were more or less left to their own and, uh, and they became very proud of that. If there was any problem in Laodicea, it was that everybody had uh, aches, aching shoulders from patting themselves on the back, okay? Because <laughs> they were doing so well, okay? And so Jesus says to them, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. Their perception of wealth and Jesus' offering of wealth were different, okay? Different set of values. 
that you may have white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Okay, he had already said to them, they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Okay, they thought they were doing just fine. And so again, Jesus' perception of the church at Laodicea and the church's perception weren't the same. And so what he, he's actually building upon what they are so proud of, the ISAB that they marketed to the world in their day. He says, you need my ISAB because your ISAB has left you blind to the truth. And there's no blindness greater than that. Uh, and you're proud of your black wool, but if you buy from me, I will give you the white garments of righteousness. And John uses the white garments. We've seen that already in a couple of other letters. We also will see it later in some of the vision that John uh, describes for us of those who are wearing white robes. White being typically a symbol of righteousness or the acceptance of God of us. And so Jesus offers them in contrast to their black wool, white garments, in contrast to their eye salve, his eye salve, so that they can substitute their spiritual blindness for sight and understanding and also that they can cover their nakedness. <laughs> one, of the, one of the dreams that I have occasionally, I haven't had one in a good while, is I'm sitting down in front of church in my underwear. <laughs> and I'm sitting, I'm sitting there trying to figure out what I did with my pants. And I'm hearing somebody introducing me. It's my turn to get up. And uh, I realized that there was a time... Brenda thought it was very spiritual on Sunday morning to set the alarm to radio and put it on a religious station. So when we would wake up, we'd hear preaching. And what was happening was I'd kind of half wake up and I'd hear the preaching and I dreamed that I was there. You know? So I told her, I said, new rule in the house. We wake up, but we never wake up to preaching. Okay? So anyway, you know, but you could, if you've ever had those kinds of dreams, you know, and you're, you're never in your bedroom, see. You're never in the shower when you dream of yourself as naked. You're always in the most public place you can be. And so nakedness is indicative of shame. Go back to the Garden of Eden. What was the first thing Adam and Eve did after they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? They covered themselves. You see. And so uh, we, we see that when Jesus says to, to this church at Laodicea, it sort of reminds me of that fable, the emperor's new clothes. Remember where the tailor came and appealed to the king's vanity? I make this wonderful fabric, but some people aren't smart enough to see it. Can you see it? And then of course, as the story continues and then the emperor marches himself naked down through the town, and somebody finally shouts out and says, he doesn't have any clothes on. Okay. And so uh, uh, sometimes we allow ourselves to be blinded by our perceptions, by our presuppositions, by our misinformation. And we see what we want to see whether, rather than what's really there. And so this is what was going on in the church at Laodicea. The other thing was, and, and I'm surmising a little bit here, the church at Laodicea may have substituted material wealth for spiritual wealth. They may have assumed because they were doing so well financially that they must be doing well spiritually. And I've seen churches like that, that, that drew a parallel well, goodness, we must be doing well. See how many people we have or see how much money we have or whatever the case might be. Uh, and, and yet there may be things in the undersurface of that church that are eroding their witness in the community. Brenda and I were members of a church. I was not the pastor there, uh, but it was a church that was wealthy in a predominantly poor community. And the church had a poor witness in the community because they isolated themselves from the community. They prided themselves uh, at which 
elite members of the community were members of their church and which lowly members of the community were not. And so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm surmising this may have been a little bit um, of, uh, of what Jesus was dealing with. Okay, notice he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. And you'll notice I've also added at the bottom of the note that uh, in the letter to Sardis, in, in, also in chapter 3, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. So Jesus makes that offer in sharp contrast to the black wool that they were so proud of. Okay, he then issues the call. And of course, we're very familiar with this verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I myself have used this verse in the past as a witnessing tool to suggest to folks that Jesus reaches out to us and through the convicting of the Holy Spirit, we become aware that we are in need of a savior. And he knocks on the door because he respects our right of choice. Rather than forcing his way in as he could do, he respects our right to make that decision for ourselves. And that's true. But that's not what this, this verse is really about. This is not a letter to a lost person. This is a letter to a church. And so as he writes to the church, contrasting again to Philadelphia, in this church, he says, I stand at the door and knock, not the open door of Philadelphia, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And there's the element of promise. He doesn't say to them, uh, you know, well, you're going to have to buy your way or, or you're going to have to make all the, if you just open the door, I will come in. One of the things that I've been encouraged to share with people through the years, if I witness to them, is to say, you don't need to tell me about your past. Because your past doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your willingness to trust your past to Jesus Christ. And to his ability to forgive your past and to make all things new. And so this is what Jesus is offering to Laodicea. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him. You know, I won't stand at the door and, you know, well, no, I don't really want to come in. He'll come in. And when he comes in, he comes in to share intimately. If you come to my house, I might stand and visit with you in the entryway. I might invite you into the family room and we'll have a seat. I might invite you to the kitchen. If I invite you to the kitchen, that's kind of the inner sanctum in our house. See? Not everybody makes it that far. And, and so, uh, now, if you've been to my house and you've only gotten to the family room, please don't be offended. It's kind of <laughs> But the point is, and we all do this, see, we all do this. If a salesman comes to the door, he never passes the front door, see. He gets in the door, he says what he wants, and he's gone. If someone comes and they want to visit with me, if a couple comes and they want to talk about their wedding, we go to the living room. If they come and they just want to socialize, they come to the family room. If someone comes and, and we want to have an intimate fellowship, they come to the kitchen. Uh, Rich and Shelba, they don't even knock on the door anymore. They just come to the kitchen because, they, you know, they, they assume on our fellowship. But it's a good assumption. So anyway, the point being, he says, I will come in and will dine with him. And he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame John 16, an interesting outline if you want to read that chapter where Jesus, as, his, as he and his disciples are moving from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, he talks to them about becoming. And then he talks to them about overcoming. And there's a, there's a, a difference there, okay? Becoming is what God is at work in us to do. Overcoming is what God is working with us to face. And there are lots of things in our world that we have to overcome, right? Sometimes it's guilt, sometimes it's sorrow, sometimes it's need, sometimes it's heartache, sometimes it's just disappointments. And, and so uh, he promised to make us overcomers and to sit down with my father on his throne. And then he concludes, 
as we have seen before, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, one of the reasons why I want to extend this study one more week is because there are some important parallels between these seven letters that we've not had time to really draw upon. Somebody will close that one blind over there for us. Rich, if you can. Uh, the sun is beautiful, but it's kind of washing out the screen. Uh, I want to show you something here, okay? We know that these are letters to seven churches. So they are letters to groups of people. Uh, and, and yet, notice something here, okay? And I took the, the liberty of highlighting. If we look at this letter to Laodicea and we see Jesus' promise or his challenge, if anyone hears my voice, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him. And on all the seven letters, the words are, are, the words are exactly the same in the conclusion. He who has an ear, let him hear. So we go from the corporate or the social to the personal. And one of the things that we're aware of when we compare God's work in the Old Testament and God's work in the New Testament is so much of the time in the Old Testament, he is working with the nation. He is working with the corporate entity. But in the New Testament, uh, Jesus introduces an intimacy to our relationship with God. When he taught his disciples to pray, our Father. See, when, when he uh, reminded his disciples that if they had seen him, they had seen the Father. And he offers himself to them. And so sometimes we see God acting in the corporate way or in, in the social way. And sometimes we see it intensely personally. And when I noticed this, one of the things that occurred to me is, okay, what is the difference between Jesus dealing with the corporate and Jesus dealing with with the individual. Someone says to me, I wish our church were more friendly. How do you do that? If you become more friendly, our church is automatically more friendly. Isn't that right? Okay. I wish our church were more mission minded. If you become more mission conscious, our church is now more mission conscious. See, there is... There is not a sense in which the things that Jesus dealt with in the churches to Revelation can be solved in a business meeting. They're not things that can be done by vote. They're not things with which the responsibility can be shifted to one group or another group within the church or even to the church as a whole, but rather to say if there is a solution to the church, if there is hope for the church, if there is a problem in the church, then the answer is in the individual. And it's interesting, I don't think that has changed. I went back to the church at Pergamum. Notice, Jesus said, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. We look at the church at Thyatira and we see this personal pronoun again repeated over and over. Notice how often. He who overcomes, he who keeps, to him I will give. He shall rule. And finally, I will give him the morning star. What struck me, by the way, uh, the church at Smyrna, that's not true, but the church at Ephesus, it is. I just, you know, I didn't want to go that far back or take that much. What I'm wanting to point out to you is what he's saying to us here. And sometimes when we look at the letters and we back away, we see things that we may not see when we're looking at them up close individually. And so what we see in one letter is true of other letters. And what Jesus is saying to us is that he works within each of us as individuals for the corporate betterment of us or the corporate blessing of us. Last week when I talked with you, or, I'm sorry, this goes back now a couple of weeks, on Sunday morning when I talked about spiritual gifts. 
And I made the comment that one reason that Jesus gives us spiritual gifts is for the benefit of the church, the body. Okay? He doesn't give us spiritual gifts so we can pat ourselves on the back or we can show off in public. He gives us spiritual gifts so that the body may be stronger. And it's amazed me through the years how often I have seen it happen just when we need somebody in our church that has a spiritual gift or a talent that they're willing to offer to the Lord, lo and behold, he sends us somebody. And I wish I had time to offer you some examples of how I've seen that through the years. Uh, God just equips the body to do what he wants the body to do. That's his promise to us. But the way he equip, equips us is through the individual. And so... Uh, we see this as, as Jesus makes his promise here. The issue is with the church. The problem is with the church. The challenge is to the church. But the solution is to the individual. And so again at Sardis, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father. And so... Uh, you know, this, this pattern repeats itself over and over uh, in each of these letters. Uh, again, to Philadelphia, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar. He will not go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God and so on. So, you know, there is, there is a message within the message to these churches. And so I wanted us to, to pause and see that as we think about these seven churches separately and individually, yet we also need to think of them collectively and corporately. What is Jesus saying to them and to us through them? And I've reminded you that there are different ways to look at these letters. Okay? And by the way, the list that I've given you is a very uh, condensed list. I mean, if others were teaching this, they'd have a list of 15 or 20 options or variations of the same. Basically, uh, my position is Jesus was writing to churches that John knew. At least one of those churches that John pastored. That was the church at Ephesus. But he was aware of, and if Paul had not been involved in, in planting those churches, John may very well, as the bishop, may have been involved in reaching out to those churches. So he was the star of one of the seven churches that's referenced in Revelation chapter 1, and he is very familiar with the other churches and with the stars of those churches. So as he is instructed to write to the star of the church, he knows who the star is, see? And, uh, and by the way, star does not mean the lead actor. Star, in this case, means the one that's put in the position of responsibility. And yet there is a message for us today. I cannot make First Baptist Church a better church than it is by telling you things you need to do. I can only make First Baptist Church a better church by being a better church member and a better pastor. It is, it is a personal accountability, a personal responsibility that lays at the feet of each of us for all of us. And so as we hear what he says to these churches, I believe he's speaking to us as well. And next week, I'll, I'll pull together just some other ways of illustrating what I'm trying to say and how these letters as a body <coughs> speak to First Baptist Church of Oakville. So, all right, question or comment? Okay, so what is God saying? to our church from the letter to Laodicea. We've talked about the historical perspective. Now we think about the contemporary application. God's word is God's word to us. German theologian Karl Barth said, it only becomes God's word to you when you read it as God's word. Um, Missouri, I think it's now been passed. I don't know if the governor has signed it, that the Bible should be taught in public schools in the state of Missouri um, as literature. 
that scares the fire out of me. Because if we raise up a whole generation of kids that are taught to see the Bible as just another good book and not to see it as God's word, then it puts them literally uh, behind the eight ball, pardon the expression, in terms of their potential relationship with God and their faith in Jesus Christ. One of the things that knits us together, one of the things that makes me a Baptist is that we are people of the book. If the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. If the Bible doesn't say it, then be careful about it. And if, if we teach a whole generation of our nation to accept the Bible as good literature, we're going to be in trouble. So, again, I don't know what the outcome has been to that legislation. I was not nearly as impressed as some people were that it was, you know, well, the fact that they're teaching, they're telling them that they have to teach the Bible. Wow. The government, government's also telling them that they have to teach about alternate lifestyles and gender choice and those things, too. And you see where that's going. So, okay, that's Hessel's free translation. It wasn't on the, on the outline. Okay, what is God saying to our church from Laodicea? Give it some thought. We'll pick it up next week. I'm grateful. Oh, sorry. We need to take a stand. We do. We need to be defined and we, we need to be definite in what we believe and what we believe is important. And, uh, and like the church at Laodicea, sometimes we're guilty of selling ourselves out for, for things that, uh, you know, somebody comes along and says, well, hey, let me help you, you know, <laughs> and it may not be help at all. Okay. I appreciate your patience. Glad to see everybody here. We've got over 40 people here tonight. I appreciate that very much. And uh, uh, again, it's, it's been a good day for those who are here just tonight. We had the great privilege and joy of welcoming new members to our family this morning, Walter and Joe. And uh, we will be praying for you tomorrow uh, as you, uh, you go under the knife. But uh, we are grateful for that. It's just been a good day. And uh, uh, I thank the Lord that... Uh, that he let me get through my sermon this morning. I hope it helped you. Uh, I went home feeling like God had, had blessed me to let me do it standing up. And uh, I really do feel better tonight, but I apologize for the melodrama. I really didn't mean to cause any concern. Uh, God is good. Someone complimented me yesterday that for my age, they admired the fact that I have so few wrinkles in my face. <laughs> and I simply commented to them, fat is a filler. <laughs> you have an anniversary this week. How many years, Jackie, is here? Oh. 53. <laughs> Bless your heart. All right. Not only is that something worth celebrating, but we're glad both of you are going to celebrate it. You know? <laughs> I've seen some marriages where only one was celebrating. So that's a very good sign for you. God bless you both. All right. Anything else before we conclude tonight? All right. Now see if I ever, if I had found some chocolate chips back there, we would have quit. <laughs> just let just let you know. Just just let me you know. You did a mess at this morning. I that's you know what you're right. I, I was kind of needing to kind of cut things short, and, and I forgot to mention. Okay. Well, see, it's not your fault. It's my fault. But next week. Next week, there better be right. There you go. Okay. Let's go to the Lord together and pray. All right. Rich, word it for us, please. Father, I thank you for this study tonight. Lord, thank you for the message John brought this morning. Also, Lord, thank you for what he's bringing me to us, Lord. Father, just be with each person as they leave here today and keep them safe. And Lord, just pray that we'll be witnessing for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. God bless you all. <laughs>